Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Kentucky Small Business Development Center's Wednesday webinar. We're going to give folks uh, just a couple more minutes to connect today. Um, while we do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Kentucky Small Business Development Center, or Kentucky SBDC for short. So we have 13 centers statewide that serve all 120 counties in the Commonwealth. The Kentucky SBDC's professional staff has a wide array of knowledge in various industries, and that offers our clients a service customized to meet their business needs. We provide no-cost assistance in areas such as market research, opportunity assessments, business plan development and execution. We help with financial modeling and projections, and we also help identify pre-venture or growth capital for your particular business. Our program is co-sponsored by the Small Business Administration and administered by the University of Kentucky in partnership with regional universities, community colleges, and the private sector. Uh, we're part of a national network, America's Small Business Development Centers, which provides service to every county in the United States. To request personal assistance, you can call 1-888-475-7232. You can email info at ksbdc.org or visit kybizhelp.com. In addition, you can connect with us socially via Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Just, just search Kentucky SVDC on each of these platforms to connect. So a recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you. So if you have trouble with the audio or you need to step away, know that we'll send you the link so you may view at a later time. I'm Janet Flaw. I'm with the Louisville Center of the Kentucky Small Business Development Centers. Leading today's discussion is David Etkin, the Center Director in Louisville, and Tony Sears, the Assistant Center Director in Louisville. Dave and Tony, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Janet. And uh, we're, we're going to have a great day today. We're uh, exploring some things that have been coming up quite a bit with, uh, with our clients. And uh, that is, how do I make sure that my... Uh, PPP loan is forgiven, and we are so lucky today to have a couple of really great professionals that have taken a deep dive and learned as much as they could about the subject today. Uh, things changed quickly, as we've all known here in the last um, couple of weeks with the SBA, but uh, everybody's working hard, doing the best they can. But we're going to talk about what we know now, and it's important to get your loan forgiven and be very careful there. So with us tonight today is uh, Erica Horn. Uh, Erica is a uh, CPA and an attorney with Dean Dorton. Um, she has over 30 years of experience. Uh, she works primarily on state and local tax issues for her clients and helps save them tax money. With her is uh, her associate, uh, John Wartenberger, is also a CPA with uh, years of experience in audit and consulting, uh, various sizes of businesses and industries across. So with that, why don't you, uh, Erica, tell us a little bit more about you and, and your background. So, Erica, we're, we're having a little trouble hearing you there. See, I knew I shouldn't turn that button on, John. I told you. So, <laughs> hit the mute button and left my cursor there so I couldn't miss it and then missed it. Uh, anyway, I'm a graduate of Transylvania University, joined a public accounting firm when I graduated. Um, usually when I'm being introduced and somebody says over 30 years, I kind of groan because it, it gives away more than I even want to acknowledge to myself. Uh, went to law school, practiced law in a, in a private setting for over 25 years and then joined Dean Dorton uh, uh, about two, almost three years ago now. I uh, have focused on state and local tax consulting, like Dave said. Um, I volunteered at the beginning of this um, uh, pandemic to be the economic injury disaster loan expert for the firm, the EIDL expert, having no idea that that program would soon become nothing compared to the Paycheck Protection Program loan. Uh, which time my whole life got swallowed up, which has been good to distract me from the other things that come with the pandemic. Uh, and so John and I, along with um, several others, make up Dean Dorton's uh, COVID-19 solutions team. Um, and we've been publishing furiously and often trying to keep up and provide as much information as we can. John? 
Yeah, of course. No, no. Um, John Wartenberger, director with Dean Dorden. Uh, grew up in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky the majority of my life. Went to the University of Kentucky um, after graduation. Similar to Erica, I joined a, a larger public accounting firm. Spent 10 years with them uh, in the Louisville, Kentucky area, serving clients mainly in healthcare, manufacturing, um, and industrial products. And then actually most recently just spent a little stint up in the Northeast in New Jersey for about six months uh, as, a, as a potential opportunity with my previous employer. And then uh, relocated back to, back to Louisville, Kentucky and joined Dean Dorton. So um, I have a wife and two young boys, so I appreciate the opportunity to get out of the house today and actually uh, dress up a little bit beyond my normal uh, sweatpants and t-shirt attire working from home. Um, and, an and I'm excited to, uh, to talk about this topic with you. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you for being here. I mean, this is a, this is a really tough topic and uh, I feel really confident about learning a lot from you guys today. Um, so with that, um, let's just get started. But before we do, I'd like to put up a poll and uh, just kind of get an idea of how everybody's experience um, uh, as far as the what your experience has been you know, applying for or receiving PPP funds. We'll leave that open for the most of the presentation. Uh, if you just you get a second, go ahead and take that poll. Let us know what's going on and we'll let you know uh, everybody's experience uh, towards the end. And maybe we can learn a little bit from that as well. So, um, Eric, you want to put, uh, I'll, I'll press the button for you there. And then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. All right. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to um, the organization for inviting John and I to talk with you today. Um, not knowing the poll results, the title slide could be wrong. Uh, we say, I have the money. How do I get forgiveness? Um, maybe some of you are still in the process of getting the money, but this has certainly been um, a hot topic. Um, as most of you, if not all of you probably know, the Paycheck Protection Program loans are, the program itself is part of the CARES Act, as we call it, which was signed by President Trump on March 27th. Um, this is your disclaimer from the recovering lawyer that's among you. Um, at this moment in time, uh, guidance on how this forgiveness calculation is going to work out is is not it, it's not robust it's minimal uh, that minimal guidance uh, and the collective wisdom judgment and ability to read however slight or great that may be of me John and others with whom we work forms the basis of this presentation um, the SBA should issue additional guidance which could vary or completely be different from <laughs> from what is in here um, as I mentioned earlier um, we are writing as fast as we can trying to keep up which is really difficult so our website um, deandorton.com uh, will have information for you um, our homepage, I think, is our COVID-19 solutions portal, or it's easy to enter from there. And um, as soon as we get additional guidance, we'll be sure and, and push that out. Um, so, John, are you starting here? Or, yep, that's three. Yeah. So John's doing the odd numbers. I'm doing the even numbers. I will walk us through the Maximize Your Forgiveness slide. So, um, how do you maximize your forgiveness, right? That is the million dollar question that most of us seem to be in right now based upon the, the tentative poll results. Um, the short answer is follow the rules, right? The, the longer and likely more complicated answer at this point is, or question, how do I follow the rules if I don't know exactly what the rules are? <laughs> and, and as Erica alluded to, um, we're all anxiously awaiting some clarifying or new guidance on the forgiveness side of the PPP loans um, beyond what currently exists in the CARES Act. So unfortunately, a lot of borrowers right now um, are, are waiting for that guidance just like we are. Um, you may be even in your eight week covered period right now and trying to make decisions based upon how you are interpreting to get forgiveness for the PPP loan proceeds. Um, and how are you using those? So right now, you know, barring any new guidance that may or may not be released while we're giving this presentation, 
what we have to work on is what's existing in the CARES Act, as well as some limited information on forgiveness um, released in subsequent interim final rules that uh, are found on the treasury.gov site. So with that in mind, um, I will walk through maybe some key reminders and maybe some key things as you're trying to think about maximizing your forgiveness as it currently states in the CARES Act. So number one, um, spend the loan proceeds on forgivable uses and do that within the covered period. So we'll go into the definition of what those forgivable and allowable uses of the loan proceeds are, as well as what the definition of the covered period is in subsequent slides. So we'll, we'll give you some more details there, but that's, that, that's the first thing to keep in mind. Uh, second is to spend 75% of the loan proceeds on payroll costs. And the payroll cost definition is defined in the CARES Act, as well as in subsequent FAQs and interim final rules. But what you want to do essentially is once you get your loan proceeds, take 75% of that and ensure that you're spending that on payroll costs. Um, and that's something that wasn't initially in the CARES Act. That's something that actually came out subsequent to and was clarified in, an, in the first interim final rule. But it's clear if you're looking at that rule that 75% of the loan proceeds have to be used on payroll costs. We'll cover that in a little bit more detail as well. Um, thirdly, and, and maybe one of the most important items too, is to retain documentation. So, and we'll, we'll go over exactly what documentation may need to be retained, but you wanna make sure that you're keeping documentation and have that handy um, related to how you're spending the, the loan proceeds on eligible uses or allowable uses for forgiveness. Um, in addition to that, you want to make sure that you're retaining documentation related to your full-time equivalent employees, as well as salary and wage levels for each individual employee. Um, and why is that as important? Well, um, one, there's a couple reductions that are currently mentioned in the CARES Act related to potentially reducing your loan forgiveness amount if you have a reduction in full-time equivalents or salaries and wages for eligible employees during the covered period. Um, there is an exemption for a piece of that that's available if you restore some of those reductions um, by June 30th, which kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the next two points on the slide. So you'll want to make sure that you're retaining documentation related to your average FTEs and your, and your salary and wage levels during the covered period um, and be able to provide that if needed on the back end. So the fourth point there is, um, and the easiest thing to avoid those reductions that I mentioned related to potential full-time employees, full-time equivalent employees, and um, a reduction in salary and wages, is to try to maintain uh, your historical levels of average FTEs and salary and wages for eligible employees during your covered period. That's the easiest way to try to avoid a reduction um, the, and, and maximize your forgiveness. The historical levels piece that's mentioned in that bullet is specifically worded that way because there are different historical periods that the CARES Act allows um, borrowers to utilize when thinking of average FTEs as well as salaries and wages. So if you're looking at your average full-time employees during your covered period um, and comparing that to a historical period, the CARES Act allows a common borrower to compare the average FTEs during the covered period to one of two historical periods. And those historical periods are either February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019, or January 1, 2020 through February 29th, 2020. If you're a seasonal um, business, then they're limiting you at this point to February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. And again, and you'll hear us kind of caveat things throughout the presentation. Those are the dates that are currently stipulated in the CARES Act. Whether or not those are subject to change remains to be unseen based upon the new guidance that's going to be released. Um, and then for salaries and wages uh, related to eligible employees, the comparable period is different from the average FTEs. So the CARES Act specifically states that for reductions in salaries and wages in excess of 25% for eligible employees, the comparative historical period is actually the most recent full quarter um, prior to the covered period where that where those employees receive salaries and wages. So the most recent full quarter, right, there's there's questions around that just from the get go as far as 
is that the day before your covered period begins and backing up 12 weeks from that? Or is it the most recently completed full quarter based upon your company's fiscal year end? So there's some questions that, that everybody is waiting for some clarity um, related to that piece. And then again, just to give a, a little bit more detail, um, for eligible employees related to that salaries and wages reduction, what that means is essentially for any employee that received a paycheck that would be annualized to be in excess of, of $100,000 during any single pay period in 2019, those employees are excluded from this calculation. So you look at all your pay periods in 2019 for any employee that received an annualized uh, pay amount during any single pay period in excess of $100,000 for that for 2019, you would exclude those from eligible employees related to these salaries and wages. So what you're left with essentially are employees that on an annualized basis during any single pay period in 2019 make less than $100,000. And then lastly on the slide, um, there is an exemption for potential rehires. So what you wanna keep in mind in order to maximize your forgiveness amount is that if you experience a reduction in full-time employees or employee salaries and wages that occurred between February 15th, 2020 and April 26th, 2020, you wanna make sure that you try to restore those to the February 15th levels on or before June 30th, 2020. In doing so, the CARES Act basically exempts you and treats that reduction as never occurring if you restore those to um, February 15th, 2020 levels by June 30th, 2020. So all that keeping in mind, um, documentation, you know, kind of weaves its way through all of those points and retaining documentation related to those FTEs, those employees, salary wage levels, you want to make sure you're spending 75% on payroll costs of the loan proceeds, and then make sure that you're spending, you know, those loan proceeds on forgivable uses during the cover period. Um, and so, Erica, I'll hand it over to you to, to go and look through a little bit more detail about what the allowable uses are. Okay. So, uh, let me just add this. Um, you're probably frustrated at this moment in time, if I'm guessing, um, because that was a lot of information and it's not written down anywhere in these slides. And uh, you are going to get copies, a PDF of the slides. Um, and we can also um, forward um, to our host uh, a PDF that we did that summarizes things in a little more detail. Um, but even then, um, you're not going to get all those dates and information that John just went through. Uh, and that's because um, we have had internally um, so many questions about how those calculations work. Um, Dave offered to allow us to go through a worksheet with you, and we would love to be able to do that. But we feel like the the guidance is so limited right now that anything we tried to do with you um, would just be confusing. Uh, we know what some of your questions are going to be, and there are questions we can answer. But when it comes to those limits and um, that uh, uh, safe harbor, if you restore employees, um, those calculations are kind of tedious, and they they don't work when you try to put the the paper. Uh, to go from the paper to the pencil and figure out little formulas. They don't always work very well. So we haven't done that. And, and I, I would apologize for that, but we're just being conservative. There are calculators out there, which I think is really brave. Um, and like John said, um, I'm certain that we will get some sort of guidance. Uh, hopefully it won't be too late. It probably will be at the end of this presentation since we will have just finished. Maybe we should have had this presentation even sooner. Uh, so um, I understand your frustration. We're frustrated too. Uh, we're right there with you. And when we know more, uh, we'll be sure and let you know. Um, so um, the Paycheck Protection Program, as I said earlier, is part of the CARES Act. The CARES Act is a federal statute. Uh, whenever something is based on a statute, the words are very, very important. And often, every word has a different meaning. And that can be really 
tedious as well. So um, that we start to see that right away when we compare the ways in which the money can be used uh, to the to the amounts that will be forgiven. So there is a difference between allowable uses of the program proceeds, loan proceeds, and forgivable uses of the loan proceeds. Um, the good news, the really, really good news is payroll costs has the same definition for both allowable and forgivable. Uh, thank goodness that one didn't shift on us. Uh, covered period, which you'll see in a minute, has different definitions. Um, so you can spend the money on payroll costs, um, interest on secured debt, rent, utilities, interest on other debt, and if you had an economic injury disaster loan, an EIDL, uh, that you obtained in a certain period of time, that has been refinanced or will be refinanced as part of your uh, paycheck protection program loan, um, and, and that then becomes an allowable use. If you look on the other side of the slide, um, the forgivable costs are a subset. Uh, so you have payroll costs, eight weeks of payroll costs, interest on secured debt, uh, rent, and utilities. So the first four things on the left transfer over to the forgivable costs on the right. Um, I'm going to back up just a second and talk a little bit more about some of those words. Um, Payroll costs <laughs> turn out, uh, we didn't know for a long time when the, when the program was first launched exactly what that meant. Uh, so if you applied really early, like between April 3rd and uh, starting around April 3rd through maybe the 10th, everybody was like, what's payroll costs mean? Well, I don't know. Um, and so we know now it's basically gross wages of your employees, gross wages. Um, plus payment of health insurance benefits, uh, premiums uh, for health insurance benefits for the self-insured. Uh, we don't know exactly if it's payments of the actual claims. Uh, we haven't seen any guidance on that, but it says health insurance benefits, uh, payments uh, of uh, for retirement benefits, 401k contributions. Again, we don't know about an actual retirement payment itself. Um, and uh, then um, state unemployment insurance. So gross wages plus health insurance benefits, retirement benefits, um, state unemployment insurance. Did I forget anything, John? No, I think you covered it. I think that's right. Yeah. So that's payroll costs. Um, interest on secured debt. So the CARES Act itself says interest on mortgage indebtedness. And I was like, okay, I know what interest on mortgage indebtedness is. That's what, that's the interest on the loan that I have for my warehouse or my, my manufacturing facility um, and that, that I operate in or operate from uh, or use for storage. Uh, so I know what that is. And then it says rent. This is the CARES Act. This is this is the allowable cost. It says utilities. Um, it says interest on other debt, uh, and then later the the re, well the refinance of the EIDLs is in there. So after the CARES Act was passed, um, when I read those those things, interest on mortgage more on mortgaged property, um, rent and utilities, I think that that means occupancy cost because if you put those things in a row then you're either if you own your property and and you have a mortgage on it you're paying interest on it or you're paying rent if you're not an owner which is uh, varies but that seems to be more common and then the utilities um, for your office space well shortly after um, the CARES Act and when the first I think round of guidance came out um, there became there's a reference actually in the forgivable section. So the allowable stuff is talked about in section 1102 and the forgivable stuff is talked about in section 1106. In 1106 on the forgivable cost, it, it talks about interest on 
at mortgage interest on real and personal property. Uh, generally, uh, my experience with mortgages have been that uh, mortgages are on real property, dirt, uh, buildings, building improvements, um, and uh, we don't refer to the to the taking of a security interest or an interest in personal property. You're manufacturing equipment, machinery. Uh, floor plan financing for automobiles, for example, we usually don't refer to that stuff as mortgage interest. Uh, that stuff is personal property. Um, so in the forgivable section, it says interest on on real and personal property. So we're like, oh, so it's broader than just mortgage interest in, in the traditional sense. Um, and so that must mean so that that must mean secured debt. So if I have a a, a a mortgage on your real estate, I have I have a secured interest. And if I have some sort of um, interest in your personal property, I have a secured interest. Uh, we usually call those uh, filings UCC one filings. You probably know that. Um, and so well, that that's a little broader. Okay, well, that's 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 great. Uh, and then rent. So in, in 1102 and allowable, it says rent. Um, in 1106, it says covered rent. And it talks uh, about eventually, either in the, in the frequently asked questions or the first IFR, interim final rule. You guys like that? Uh, it's kind of an oxymoron. An interim final rule, which is the regulations for the program that are being issued by the SBA slash Treasury uh, says that um, makes reference to the idea that rent can be on real property or personal property, uh, which has raised the question: Does that mean if I pay rent, if I pay a lease payment for my automobile uh, that I use in my business, does that count? Um, if I pay rent for the copy machine, if I pay a lease payment for the for the copy machine, does that mean that that counts? And certainly, certainly there is an argument for that. Um, that seems to me to be much different than where we started in Section 1102. Um, and, and one of the other themes here, folks, is that um, the your lender, your bank, uh, credit union, whoever it is, is going to be the, the folks um, that ultimately will be the folks that ultimately decide some of these things, uh, absent guidance. And so you should ask them these questions as well. Utilities are utilities. Although my most recent learning related to utilities, yes, it includes internet. Uh, yes, it includes your cell phones or any cellular uh, VoIP type system. Uh, uh, and if you are a, uh, a sole proprietor uh, and you do your business out of your car, which some folks do, it includes gas for your car. I couldn't have been more surprised. Um, so, so that was interesting to me. Um, as John said, documentation is critical. We'll talk about that a little more. So a subset of what you can use the money for is what is forgivable, and it is eight weeks of that money. John? That's right. That's right. And so that brings us to the covered period. And that's that's a, a term that I mentioned earlier on my previous slide and um, that Eric has alluded to a little bit in, in her previous comments. So keeping with the theme of the allowable and forgivable uses of the loan proceeds, um, the term covered period means different things in different circumstances under the CARES Act. So when you're talking about allowable uses that Erica just covered, um, the covered period to use the loan proceeds for allowable uses ends on June 30th, 2020. And on the contrary, when you're thinking about forgiveness um, and expending those loan proceeds and, and using those loan proceeds um, to be eligible for forgiveness, the covered period is defined as the eight weeks from the date of the disbursement of the loan proceeds. 
So the first date that those loan proceeds become available um, in your bank account, take eight weeks from that date, and that's the end date of the covered period for forgiveness. So as an example, and you can see there on the slide, you know, uh, assuming a borrower receives their loan proceeds and those were dispersed um, from the lender and hit the borrower's bank account on April 15th, 2020, um, those proceeds, those loan proceeds, the borrower, if they're seeking forgiveness on 100% of the lo loan proceeds, they need to make sure they're spending those by end of day on June 10th, 2020, which is going to be eight weeks from April 15th, 2020. Now, say they don't spend all the loan proceeds during, you know, by June 10th, 2020, but they still can spend some after June 10th, 2020. Well, those those amounts that are spent after June 10th, 2020 may still be allowable, may still be eligible based upon the allowable uses that Erica just covered. They're just not going to be forgivable based upon the eight week cover period. So the key, the, the key point here is to make sure that you're well aware of what the end date on that eight week period is such that you know, when do I need to use my loan proceeds by in order to achieve forgiveness or be eligible for forgiveness? And then also keeping in mind that general use end date of June 30th, 2020. And, you know, John, um, the people, the 25% of the people who have just, just applied or approximate 25% uh, or in the process of applying, you're like, wait a minute. Uh, my covered period is going to end after June 30th. What about that yeah. circumstance? That's exactly right. And that's where we're, we're awaiting guidance to extend that period at this point, because for those that are just now applying, you can see through the, through the interim final rules and the FAQs that have been released that essentially lenders have up to 10 days after the application has been approved to disperse loan proceeds to the borrower. So, Say you submit an application today and you receive your, your approval number today, you have 10 days from that point for the lenders to actually give you the funds in your bank account. So, you know, if, if 10 days from now you're just getting your first disbursement and that starts the eight week period, that's going to extend beyond June 30th, 2020. So in a certain in a, in a certain sense, this date has to be extended and we expect it to be extended based upon the additional funding that was required and approved by the House, Senate and, and the president. Um, we're just awaiting on that final documentation to say what is that extended period through, whether it's through July or August or September. We don't know at this point. Well, you have to imagine that it's going to be extended beyond June 30th. Yeah, and it may be until this round of money is gone before we get that answer so they can right. set a date. Um, so, again, we're, we're looking at how to maximize forgiveness. As John mentioned, um, when the CARES Act was first passed, there was no um, stipulation that 75% of the expected forgiveness amount had to be for payroll costs. That was added um, in the first interim final rule issued um, and it was added because they expected there to be um, a shortage of funds and so they thought that the best way to ensure that it was used to put people back to work which was the purpose of the cares act in part would be to make it for um, payroll costs well 75 percent of it for payroll costs what we've had difficulty with is uh, what do you measure the 75 percent against so do you measure it against loan proceeds if your loan proceed is a hundred thousand dollars do you have to spend seventy five thousand dollars on um, payroll costs um, or if you get a hundred thousand dollars and you realize that you're not going to be able to spend seventy five thousand dollars on payroll costs can you use can can you just figure out what what your total payroll cost is and make sure you don't spend more than seventy five percent of that amount? So um, if you're if you could spend fifty, then in total you don't want to spend more than whatever the difference would be. I can't do the math without a calculator. That even sounds algebraic, which makes it harder. Uh, but um, so, so we're a little unsure there. We need a little guidance there right now for purposes of for until we have that guidance, you should see if it's possible for you to spend um, 
75% on payroll costs, that's going to cause you to ask questions. Um, John and I talked about this, like, can I pay bonuses? Um, how can, what, what kinds of things can I do, Erica and John, to get there? Still waiting on that guidance. Um, um, different people view it different ways. And um, I don't know that I'm going to take a position on that. John might. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so, so that's out there. And, and John talked about uh, potential reductions in the loan forgiveness. Um, so there are, there, there are two sets, um, uh, maybe three of, of potential reductions. So one would be failure to spend 75% on payroll costs. Another one is this idea that um, there has been a reduction in FTEs or um, salaries and wages. And then I guess the third thing I was thinking is really a subset of that. In certain circumstances, you can remedy that reduction uh, by a date certain, uh, which again, may be longer than June 30th, we don't know, um, to try to uh, make sure you get that 100% uh, reduction. Yeah, okay, yeah that's right, Erica. And the, the only thing I'll chime in on, um, you know, rolling back to your comment around, um, you know, thinking of the 75% payroll costs, and if you can't meet that initially in relation to your loan proceeds, you know, as people think about bonuses or pay raises, or something like that that you could potentially implement during the covered period to kind of bump up what those payroll costs you know normally might look like. Uh, there, there's no guidance currently that's that's prohibiting you know you from paying a bonus or implementing a pay raise during this this covered period. The one thing just to be mindful of is it, it does it, it does exclude payroll costs, you know, for each employee that would be in excess of $100,000 annualized during the covered period. So if you're going to pay a bonus, um, if you're going to, you know, implement a pay increase, just be mindful that if you, if you annualize those salaries and wages received by employees during that eight week period, and that turns out to be in excess of $100,000 annualized, you're only going to be eligible for forgiveness for up to $100,000 of that amount. So, John, we we said, you and I said to Dave that we would spend about 15 or 20 minutes on the slide. Now we've been, <laughs> then we will do questions. And now you and I have taken, what, three or four slides and made it 30 minutes. So maybe we can speed it up. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe so. I will I, I will try to be brief on, on, on this piece since we've covered it a little bit already. Um, as you can tell from the, from the title of the slide, document, 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 right? That is of utmost um, importance during this eight week period, just to make sure that you've got the documentation that may be needed because at this point, a lot of us are really just kind of in the dark on exactly what is going to be needed or that may vary um, depending on what lender you're going through as we saw on the upfront application process, exactly what types of supporting documentations lenders are going to request. Um, but, Simplistically, we can expect there to be documentation needed related to payroll costs, including health care, retirement benefits, um, expenses uh, during the covered period related to covered mortgage interest, rent and utilities, as Erica already covered. Um, some examples of, of what we can expect that supporting documentation to look like or, or what people should be holding on to, uh, cancel checks, payment receipts, account statements, those types of support documentations will likely be, be become handy um, with dealing with lenders on the back end when applying for forgiveness related to mortgage interest, rent, or utility payments. Um, and then again, as, as previously discussed, you know you want to make sure that you're retaining some level of documentation related to your average full-time equivalents and salary and wage support for employees as we think about that redu those reductions potentially to your forgiveness amount and comparing those to historical periods. So, and lastly, um, one of the items that's specifically in the CARES Act is that you can expect a, an additional good faith certification on the borrower's behalf that the records that are being provided um, to support the, the use, of the pay, uh, use of the loan proceeds are the same documents that have been provided to the IRS. Thank you, John. And so on the uh, payroll costs, Form 941, more likely than not, uh, your payroll runs for the eight weeks, 
uh, whether that's two, four, however many that is, eight, um, and uh, your unemployment uh, return uh, for the applicable quarter, uh, those are all highly likely, if not certain, certainties of things that you're going to need. Self-employed individuals, they came out with an interim final rule on self-employed individuals, I think it was last week. Um, um, there are different components, but one of the things that um, is clear is if you uh, had more than $100,000 in uh, net profits, you're going to be limited to $15,385 of um, forgivable costs uh, for that. Uh, and uh, for the rent and the utility payments or the mortgage interest, whatever it is, um, those have to be items that you deduct on your Schedule C. All right, so now what, right? I mean, we've gone through all this detail. We've gone through the information. We've taken up too much time, as Erica mentioned. But what what are the key reminders, uh, you know, that you need to think about when thinking about loan forgiveness and, and making sure that you're maximizing your potential? Um, first, make sure you calculate that end date of the covered period. Again, that's eight weeks starting from the date of the first distribution of the loan proceeds. Second, once you get those loan proceeds from the from the lender, just take 75% of whatever that amount is and try to spend at least that amount on eligible payroll costs during that eight week period. Um, third, if there's been any reduction in full-time equivalent employees and or em employees uh, salary and wages, you wanna try to restore those or make whole before June 30th, 2020, as it relates to the February 15th, 2020 period. So whatever those levels were at February 15th, 2020, you want to try to restore them to those levels by June 30th, 2020. And lastly, as we've mentioned, recommendation is to stay in communication with your lender. Um, as additional information and guidance is released, lenders are going to be reacting to that. Some lenders might require additional supporting documentation above and beyond what other lenders might be requiring. So staying in communication and knowing exactly what your lender is going to need or what their maybe loan forgiveness application may look like is going to be greatly important um, so that you can prepare and try to apply and receive loan forgiveness as quickly as possible. So now that we've covered the main points and, and we can finally kind of turn it over to Q&A, um, mm -hmm. I think I'll, I'll hand it over and we can, we can open up the line for some questions. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. That was, that was great. That was really informative. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, I know I've had a lot of questions and um, I know everybody on the on uh, the call today is uh, has just as many, if not more, and we've got a ton of questions on our chat log. But uh, before we jump there, uh, I just want to talk about our poll here, and it looks like uh, about uh, seventy three percent of people that are attending today have uh, applied and gotten uh, approval for their PPP loan. Only one percent applied but were denied, and we have a full uh, thirteen percent that applied and they're just waiting to hear. So. Uh, over, you know, overwhelmingly, everyone um, is in the queue and got some money coming and, and going forward. So uh, that being said, <clears throat> since I'm talking, I get to ask the first question. And uh, <laughs> here's my question. And I guess uh, it's not, I guess I'm not looking for an answer, but maybe some comments and some tips here. Um, because uh, when I think about the, uh, the PPP program, and there's kind of a it's kind of an issue that um, uh, with so many gray areas on the forgiveness portion, there's a fair chance that borrowers may not have their loan forgiven. And then, depending on how much money you were were given on your loan, um, your one percent interest rate, which sounds great, has to be paid back within, in essence, 18 months. We can put which can actually put a severe cash crunch on a business, and they may not even be able to pay that money back at all. Um, what, what, I know you guys have given this some thought. What, what are some things that you think that people on the call should today think about and prepare for um, you know, going forward to get to the end of this? Well, I think you want to first off make sure that you spend your money on allowable uses. Uh, because right away, if you don't, then uh, you're in some hot water. Uh, I think you ought to um, consider whether you can uh, spend the money only on forgivable uses. 
and just keep the rest of the money so that uh, you can pay it back quickly um, and so that between what you keep and what is forgiven you're you're whole uh, if that's possible um, the third thing would be what we've been talking about is maximize um, in each way you can uh, the forgiveness amount by keeping your documentation spending 75 percent on payroll costs and the other things that we've talked about john yeah no i agree i think that's a great point on the allowable uses you know first and foremost you know you want to make sure that you're using those on eligible uses as stated in the cares act you know if you're if you're not doing that and you're intentionally using them for things that aren't going to be allowable it's you know it specifically has come out that they could seek you know charges and fines and penalties against you if if it's found that you're intentionally misusing those funds and if your uh, name's with, shake shack then baby you definitely are <laughs> they're definitely coming for you ruth chris yeah yeah all the all the all the big names out there in the press lately lakers um, yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so i think i think what erica said are, are great points to consider you know try Try to spend as much as you can on allowable uses, on forgivable uses, and to the extent that you're left over with some funds and you don't want to be saddled with having those out there and the interest rate that comes along with it, repay mm -hmm. those as quickly as possible and yeah. work with your lender as, as, as quickly as you can on identifying what that amount's going to look like. And, right. and the, the other thing, Dave, that comes to my mind is if you're still waiting for the money and you don't this this is not a loan for a business that was on the brink of bankruptcy <laughs> to your exact point uh, so if you don't think you're going to be able to do these things or service the debt uh, then maybe you don't want the money in the first instance mm -hmm. yeah yeah or maybe as as additional guidance comes out about what could potentially be forgivable and what maybe you have to spend the use the loan proceeds on meaning like 75 percent of payroll and you don't think you're going to be able to achieve that then maybe work with your lender and say, I know my application was for this amount of funds and I'm expecting this amount, but can we go ahead and haircut that somehow once you receive the funds and what you're giving to me such that I'm not going to have any left over and I'm not charged getting charged interest rate during the period. Yeah. I guess a good takeaway from what you both just said is the communication with your lender is key and, and I would communicate frequently, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Tony, you guys still there? Yes, I am, Dave. Do we have any questions today? <laughs> oh, yes, we do. <laughs> first of all, Erica and John, thank you again for being with us. Um, one of the first questions I have for you are, is are payroll costs defined as both full-time and part-time? Uh, yes, there's no distinction uh, made uh, between full-time and part-time employees. Um, and I'll keep it straightforward and simple that it's your, it's your total payroll, total gross wages. Thank you. The next question is, is the loan forgivable amount considered to be taxable? Um, they've been getting conflicting responses on that. Yeah. Uh, John probably, if it has the word tax in it, John might prefer that I answer that question. Um, even though if we get very deep, then we're all in doo-doo. Um, so no, the um, income, the forgiveness um, is not going to be, the, 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 the amounts that are forgiven aren't, well, the whole thing is not taxable. The pro loan proceeds are not taxable, will not be taxable income. The question that we don't know the answer to is, what do you do about the expenses that you're paying with those proceeds? So if you pay eight weeks of payroll cost with forgiven monies, do you get to deduct for tax purposes those eight weeks of payroll cost? And we just don't know. And um, people um, can argue both sides of that coin and have argued both sides of that coin. So that's the wait and see, but the, the loan proceeds themselves are not taxable. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here that's someone who's self-employed and they want to know, is the interest from a home equity line considered to be forgivable? John, do you want to or you want me to? <laughs> You can, you can take a stab at it, but I'm, I'm happy to, to give my initial thoughts. I, I, I would think that it would depend on what that home equity line is used for. 
and whether it's it's used especially for for your business um but that but and if it was potentially it could be forgivable but erica i don't know if you feel differently now. yeah so you know when you're self-employed that home mortgage i mean that 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 deduction for a home office is incredibly controversial uh, matter of fact it's almost a sure way to get audited if the irs had enough people if you take a deduction for home office expense so if you've taken a deduction for home office expense perhaps as john said especially if it's related to that home office um if not i would i'd veer away from that one Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Amanda Perkins. Hello, Amanda. Um, she wants to know, um, should you pay federal, state, and local taxes out of the 3P proceeds? And if so, does that count toward your 75% payroll expenses? So, um, the, it, so the total gross wages paid to the employees, that whole piece, uh, which includes federal withholding um, and federal Social Security um, FICA, we call it, the 7.65%. Um, that, uh, all of that is included in payroll cost. Employers pay another 7.65%, um, and that is not included. So you don't want to you don't want to think that that's included that's not included federal unemployment is not included but state unemployment is thank you so we've been getting quite a few questions on the uh, economic injury disaster loan advance <laughs> uh, people have received that and they want to know is that um, um, advance going to be reduced or i'm sorry will it reduce the forgivable loan amount from the PPC? yes okay it, it does Okay, thank you. Um, some people are wondering, is the covered period of eight weeks from the time your loan is funded? Um, could you answer that question for us, please? For the PPP, the eight weeks, when does it yeah. start? John? I would say, yeah, I would say your eight weeks starts when those loan proceeds hit your bank account and you're available and you're able to start using them. And last night, Treasury slash the SBA issued a statement that said, you can't ask your lender to give it to you a little bit at a time in order to um, extend that payment period, that the entire loan proceeds have to be dispersed at one time. Yeah, yeah. initially there was some guidance that was, pointed out, that, that was uh, put out there that basically talked about the first disbursement of your loan proceeds, almost indicating that there would be multiple disbursements of it and that the eight week period started on the first disbursement. The new guidance that Erica is referring to basically instructed lenders, you got to give all the proceeds up front. You can't start phasing the proceeds over a period of time such that the borrowers can't utilize them all from day one. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Tony, I, I've got a question here from uh, Juliet, and um, I think we talked a little bit about this, but can you clarify about what the uh, what constitute utilities in the forgiveness period? Is it just electric and water or does it include like phones and websites and other things like that. Yeah, the uses, um, and I'm, I think it's gas, check me on this, uh, Erica, I think it's gas, yeah. electric, water, transportation, um, telephone, internet, telephone, okay. mm -hmm. I think is what's specifically stated in the CARES Act. And, and if you're not a self-employed individual with an automobile and you're thinking, what in the world does transportation mean? Unless if you are a business that buys your, um, typically your gas, but your gas or electricity, either one, you pay somebody for the gas or electricity, and then you pay somebody else to get it to your door, to the, to the you know, a lot of large manufacturers which probably aren't on this call, but they, they have their own um, supply, uh, then that transportation cost uh, would be part of those utility costs. That's what I think they were going for there. And then um, we got gas for automobiles for self-employed individuals. So. Um, the next question I have is, what happens to your forgiveness calculation if you had employees quit after January 1st, but before the pandemic hit? 
if you had employees quit after January 1st, but before the pandemic, so I would before assume February that's 15th. before February 15th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so to me, from a forgiveness standpoint, I think I've mentioned it earlier, but you have two potential reductions to your forgiveness amount and you have two historical periods to choose from if you're not a seasonal business. So if you have employees quit after January 1, but before February 15th, that's going to reduce your comparable period, so to speak, that you could use to compare your covered period to, um, which may help you actually um, when you're thinking about a potential reduction to employees. So said another way, if you had 10 employees as of December 31, 2019, and two of those quit and you have eight before February 15th, you can take that eight and compare it to your covered period rather than potentially having to look back to 2019. Okay. Uh, this is Janet. I have a quick question kind of in that same regard. So what if you had uh, a small business that um, uh, had to furlough uh, a portion of their employees and have received PPP uh, and now trying to restore those um, positions and getting yeah. resistance from those employees and coming back? This is a great question. Um, when an employer makes an offer to an employee to return to work and the employee says, yo, baby, I'm making way too much money on unemployment to come back to work. Uh, that employer is supposed to send a message to uh, the Kentucky Unemployment Insurance Office, which has a, a, a name uh, that's not unemployment, um, and let them know that they have extended um, the uh, offer to the to the employee and the employee's um, uh, uh, unemployment compensation will terminate um, and I wish I didn't think about getting that address for you um, you could probably google it uh, or whatever browser you use search engine you use um, and so you can just tell those folks um, hey great I hear what you're saying but I'm required by law to let unemployment know that I have extended an offer to you and your employee, your unemployment is going to terminate. And so you can have that happen with a job and come back to work <laughs> or uh, otherwise. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, so I've gotten a bunch of questions about, uh, again, a little clarification on the, the interest, the forgivable, you know, what's allowable for interest. Uh, so questions on, can I charge off my uh, line of credit, um, credit card, business credit card, you know, that sort of thing. Can you discuss that again? Yeah. So it's allowable. Your interest on your credit card mm -hmm. or your line of credit is allowable, but it's not forgivable. Okay. And you want to make sure, just to clarify that point too, you want to make sure that whatever is outstanding on your line of credit or your credit card, was in place as of February 15th, 2020. So it's talking about interest on other debt obligations that existed as of February 15th, 2020. So if you've drawn on your line of credit or you've extended your credit card subsequent to February 15th, 2020, that interest on those, um, on those debt facilities are not, is not an allowable use. Is that correct, Erica? Well said. So I'm actually getting a couple of questions about medical insurance premiums being considered a payroll cost. Mm -hmm. um, some people have been hearing conflicting um, answers and they just wanted clarification on that. I can't imagine that you could have heard conflicting answers <laughs> in, in this uh, morass of, of uh, this situation. Yes, insurance, health insurance. So here's something else. Health insurance premiums are payroll costs. I've been asked, well, what about short-term disability and life insurance? Uh, life insurance, no, for sure. Short-term disability, uh, maybe in the sense that sometimes employers require employees to take um, short-term disability for certain medical conditions, um, even even parental leave, for example. But if you want to be safe, then the answer to that is no. So health insurance premiums, pure health insurance premiums, yes. All the other things, no. What about workers' compensation? Would that be included? No, no it is okay. not. Thank you. Um, 
question here um, from Jeremy Griggs. He says, am I supposed to call my employees back from off of unemployment even if my business is not open? Or can I wait to use the money when we open back up as long as it is as it is before June 15th? Yeah. Isn't that goofy, Jeremy? I mean, I think that was the name. So am I supposed to pay, Erica, am I supposed to pay people to sit at home? I don't have anything for them to do. I, I can't even open. Um, I, th I think the technically correct answer at this moment in time is yes, you pay them to sit at home. Um, and that's a terrible result. Um, I think that that happened because um, uh, the SBA was forced. Well, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. I think that the program got out in front of the, uh, the the distribution of the proceeds and everything got out in front of what the act really meant. And I think what they really hoped was that this whole thing wouldn't roll out until early to mid-May when, as you can see, businesses are starting to reopen. But the reality of that is yes. Okay. Dave, did you have any questions? Um. So um, here's one. If, um, if a full-time employee retired in February huh. and was not due to the COVID-19, COVID does that position have to be refilled um, before the end of the eight-week period since they'd be included in the previous calculation? Yeah. And, and again, you have, just to reiterate, you have two, a couple different comparable periods. So it doesn't have to be that January 1, 2020 through February 29, 2020 period. You can go back to 2019 if needed and look at February 15, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. Um, but to the extent that they were they retired, it sounds like during that comparable period or maybe even after February 15th to where it would potentially cause a reduction um, you know, in the headcount, thinking about what it's compared to in the, in the covered period, you would need to try to rectify that reduction somehow by June 30th, 2020 to avoid a potential reduction. In the gains. And of course, what do you want, what you want to think about then is, is what's going to cost me more 1% <laughs> interest on that amount of forgiveness or replacing that person, uh, depending, you know, uh, you might just choose to pay the interest. And the and the amount, the the loan principal. Mm -hmm. I have a question here um, on this company. They own um, they own residences for a social service agency that they have, and they want to know can they count the interest on all of those mortgages that they own, um, the buildings that they own. Okay, so somebody owns. Um, so it's housing. like a, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and has mortgages on all that property. And is that interest um, allowable and forgivable? I think the answer to that is yes. Okay. And then the other question is, can we include insurance premiums in with utility calculations? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not to my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> haven't seen anything that says you could. Uh, so nope, I don't think so. Yeah. And Dave, if you don't mind, if I, if I can just back up and maybe clarify, you know, that that retirement employee question, because I feel like that's a question a lot of people have. Yeah. yeah I just, it may, it might, might be helpful to give an example there. So if, if you have somebody that retired, you know, between January 1 and, and February 15th, and say your headcount before they retired was 10, right? And now you're at nine because they retired. If you maintain that level of headcount at nine throughout your eight week covered period, there's no need to then think about potentially replacing them. Like your, your comparative, your nine over nine is, is going to be a hundred, right? So like there's no reduction. So I just want to make sure that just because somebody retires, as long as you're maintaining that level of headcount throughout the covered period and you look at that headcount during the covered period and there's no reduction, there's no need to go and try to rectify that. So, John, what if somebody goes on maternity leave on May 1st? Does that count yeah. against you? That's a good question. That's a good question. Maternity leave, short-term disability. Um, we get, we're get we getting those questions around, you know, how does that person, you, you know, how do you 
think about a potential reduction in headcount or a reduction in full-time equivalents if somebody's out on maternity leave or somebody's out on short-term disability. And the question right now is, or the answer right now is, well, we don't know how the SBA or Treasury Department is defining what a full-time equivalent is. And so the full-time equivalent could be somebody who's working 40 hours a week. And then somebody on maternity leave might not be working 40 hours a week, so they would be excluded from that definition. Or it could mean your employees on payroll that you're paying as if they were full-time employees. So that would then include those people out on maternity leave or short-term disability or paternity leave. Um, so we're still kind of waiting on a little bit of clarity around exactly what that full-time equivalent definition is. Um, I have a question here. This company, they have a, a fleet of vehicles that they provide, trans they go to people's homes and provide transportation, and they want to know if fuel for those vehicles would be considered an allowable or forgivable amount. Yeah, so here's what happened, just so you know. So um, when um, the interim final rule on self-employed individuals came out. That is the first time, and, and the rule is very specific. The rule is for self-employed individuals who file a Form 1040 Schedule C. So that's not a partner in a partnership or a shareholder in an S corporation. That is simply, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't have a big business. It's just a person who files a Schedule C. Um, when that um, interim final rule was issued, it was the first time that we saw utility costs defined to include gas for a car. Okay. So I don't know if we can transport that definition of utility costs from that Form 1040 Schedule C self-employed person to any other business. Okay. Typically, when I interpret the law, well, I just, I'm going to stop there. No, <laughs> it's hard for me to stop. I mean, that's, that, that's the main question. And if you just look at the definition of covered utility payments, it includes transportation. Right. Now, what that means, whether that's gas, mileage, you know, it, it's it's a little bit up in the air, but Derek is spot on as far as it, it's unclear whether or not you can transplant that definition for a Schedule C individual to a, somebody operating a business. And, and also to that point, John, who knows, maybe that's what transportation meant. Maybe, you know, maybe Erica in her experience has just made up this idea about the utilities that charge, you know, that you can pay separately for for utilities to be delivered. Maybe Erica, that's Erica's definition of transportation within the realm of utilities, mm -hmm. but that's not the only definition perhaps of transportation. And since either thankfully or regretfully, we can't read the mind of Congress to know what that means. Um, you know, we just, we need guidance. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Will we just need? And just to know, we're not throwing any shade on the SBA. Uh, those people are not. Those people have to. The only people who are working harder and are more upset than me is the people at the SBA, um, because um, they have been thrown into one heck of a situation uh, trying to do all these things at the same time, and they're getting nothing but flack. So let me uh, let me just ask a question on what we just talked about, a little clarification. So we just talked about a self-employed person that files a Schedule C. What about a single member LLC, which is essentially the same thing with a little bit of paper on top of it? Well, so it just depends on what, what so a single member LLC, uh, I guess, I, I'm confused and, and John might not know either whether or not that entity can be it, it's going to depend on how that probably depend on how that entity rolls up for tax purposes mm -hmm. so if that entity rolls up into a corporation or a partnership that and and its income is reported at that level then that could be a different answer from uh when i i i had my little erica l horn um plc for law because i knew that 
my grandmother was going to pass away and I was going to need to probate the estate. So I mean, I know I was going to have to practice law some way and I can't do that under an accounting firm. So, so that was a schedule. That was just a schedule C item for me. Right. If I am a, if I'm a corporation and I have my real estate and a single member LLC and that single member LLC rolls up into my S corp, my partnership, my C corp, that can be a different answer. Yeah, that's great. We, we get a lot of questions from, for example, um, you know, just a, a, basically like a graphic designer gets a, a, a check from a company that they just do gig work for and they've set up their own little LLC, you know, which they just file a state return and essentially have a K-1 for their personal tax return. Um, so that's that's been a lot of uh, a lot of questions on that. Don, you got another question? I sure do. Thank you. Um, this comes from Tim Guthrie. He says, how do you address payroll periods that fall outside the eight weeks, i.e. a monthly payroll cycle? Yeah. Where, do, where does the pay date, excuse me, where does the pay date fall outside of the eight weeks? Should I run a special payroll to be within the eight weeks? Yeah. Thank you for asking that, Tim. Um, that's so, <laughs> so in one place uh, with regard to forgiveness, it says, incurred and paid in the covered period in one place it says incurred and paid well you my my, my you're going to incur and pay eight weeks of payroll what whatever that means you have to do run a special payroll um if you're going to maximize your forgiveness costs so um yeah that's what you want to do you want to make sure that you and just tell your people hey guys gals uh you're going to get this check early. Don't spend it all at one time. <laughs> it's going to be a while before you get another one. Okay. Um, so we have here a question from Melissa Estes. She goes, who forgives the loan? Your lender? <laughs> John? Yeah. Yeah. The lender will forgive the loan. The SBA basically reimburses the lender for the forgiveness piece that they're forgiving. Okay. And that's why it's so important to have good communication with your lender, uh, because again, they they're in the same boat that we are, and you know they're they're um, trying to deal with a gray area, and they're doing the best they can. So make sure that you're up to date with what they're thinking and what they're going to require, and then always have good uh, good records. The, this question comes from Tricia Weber. She says, "Is spending actually writing the check, or when payroll and taxes are accrued?" Yeah, that gets back to the encoded yes. questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then this question. Just let me, Tony. Just let me. So John and I think that it's really a cash sort of thing. Uh, that being said, because of that one use of the word, and I I searched this again last night. That one use, one time they use incurred. Because the, the question that usually comes up is, Erica, can I prepay my rent? Can I pay six months of rent um, to make sure my costs are forgivable? Well, not not if it's not if that incurred word, is, not if they're serious about that, because you're only going to incur, incur eight weeks of rent. But if it's really all about the cash I spend, if it's really all about what I spend in eight weeks, then, um, as, you know, as long as you don't get over 25 percent um then yes and um boy i wish i knew yeah now you have to think about the spirit of the act and what they were intending to do and i don't think the intent was to prepay a bunch of expenses with these loan proceeds um, i think they were really trying to bridge the gap for these companies and give people the, these loans to help cover the expenses that they would typically incur during this eight week period Although, so able to pay out. although John, what if <laughs> my what if my customers have cash today, but I know they're not going to have cash in July, so I'm getting paid today, and I can pay my rent, but come July, I'm mm -hmm. not going to have cash to pay my rent. Can't mm -hmm. I go ahead and take this cash and pay my rent? I mean, we yeah. just don't know. Yeah, we just don't know right now. 
Um, Dave, do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, we do. Let's do okay. It. Eric and John, you all are troopers. That's all I will say. So I'm thank not... you. <laughs> I've got okay, a hard stop have... at one thirty. Otherwise, I'm here with you. All right. Okay, yeah. I understand. Okay, so Melissa asked the question. Are you saying that all funds must be spent by June 30th, regardless if you are looking for forgiveness or not? That's the allowable you that's when the period for the for the use of the funds ends right now is June 30th, 2020. I'm gonna go out and live and say no. But there's nothing to base that on. Although I really believe so they intended to be making loans through June 30th. Right. So, yeah, I mean, they thought you would be spending past June 30th. So it's just goofed up. So that's but because they were intended to make loans through June 30th, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go out on a limb and say. <laughs> OK, I, I just can't. I can't. <laughs> OK, so Darcy says, if I don't use all 75 percent on payroll, um, can I get the portion I do spend on payroll forgiven? Or will I get nothing? Yeah, that's a that's a question that's out there right now that that's unknown, and people are speculating on what that means. Whether it's a it's an all or nothing item, or whether they're just going to take you know, say you spend sixty five percent on payroll, you know, you're just gonna you're gonna get dinged for that ten percent that you're not hitting seventy five percent. We we don't know at this point. So since this was free, this was free, right, Dave? They yep. didn't pay anything for okay. Mm. Then I'll give you some free thoughts here. <laughs> if they do that, if they and I to me, they is treasury, not the SBA. If they were to make that the rule, if they were to make it a cliff and it's an all or nothing, people are gonna go the crowd is gonna go wild. Right. <laughs> and that won't last. So well, John and I don't think it will be that way. Again, it's just the language is terrible, which is what happens when you try to write legislation that's complex and a very short amount of time in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Uh, but that will be hard to believe. Yeah. yeah, you're essentially going to be saddling companies with debt that they don't need at that point or didn't want. And so uh, I would highly doubt that they would come out and say it's an all or nothing. I got a quick question from Candy. It's kind of specific, but it's interesting. So a corporate entity pays rent to employee owner who owns the building personally. Is that still a forgivable expense? Yeah. Yeah. We, we've gotten that question about, you know, just expenses in general paid to related parties, whether those are, you know, allowable or forgivable expenses. And right now there's nothing in the, in the act unless Erica, I've, I've missed something or the subsequent rulings that have said that that's prohibited. So right. right now, that's we, we are treating those as allowable costs or forgivable costs, even if they're paid to a related party. Okay. So I'm going to do one more question and then hand it back over to you, Dave. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. So um, this comes from Gwen. She says, we have sales, a salesman that, sorry, we have salesmen that are subcontractors and they are paid on commission. Is that part of my payroll cost for allowable and forgivable? Um, so the definition of payroll cost includes commissions. Uh, when, when you say subcontractor, it makes me hesitate because the rules about independent contractors have been kind of cranky. Um, so I don't know. My, yeah, my, my take on that would be really on the front end. I think there was some guidance that was released talking about, you know, companies that might have employees and independent contractors that they're paying, how to include those employees or independent contractors in your application and your calculation of your loan amount up front. And the clarifying guidance that came out, you know, whether it was timely or not, was essentially if you have a business that has both employees and independent contractors, and Erica, keep me honest here, that the independent that you're supposed to exclude those independent contractors because they have the ability to apply for a PPP loan on their own and on their own behalf. So if you did that on the front end and then you're going to go back and you're going to try to pay those people on the back end during the covered period, I don't think that would be included as a forgivable cost during the covered period. 
but I would go back to the front end and see how you included or excluded those individuals as part of your loan application. Yeah, because to John's point, that that idea that they were excluded came out after right. after people started applying for the loan. And if you read the CARES Act before you read anything else, which I don't suggest anymore because it's changed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Then clearly, so so we're a big agricultural state, right? A lot of agricultural labor, especially related to the, the horses, is um, is independent contractor type labor, uh, 1099 miscellaneous type labor. And um, it, it seems to me that it was the clear intent of the act itself that those costs be included in payroll costs. But then we got guidance that, ex that said no. So, yeah. Uh, and talk to your lender mm -hmm. if they have time. Yeah. Okay, Dave, well, I'll go ahead and hand it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Tony. Well, there was a ton more questions. We're really sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but, um, you know, contact us. Um, if you have any questions, we'll keep in touch with, uh, with John and Erica. And uh, if, if we get some breaking news, um, maybe we'll invite you two back out to clarify things for us again. Would that be okay? As long as you give us a little bit of time to figure out what the breaking news means. <laughs> <laughs> and what we still don't know. So I had been waiting for this silver bullet to answer all the questions. And all then right. it occurred to me that it's not going to be a silver bullet. It's just going to be a bullet. And so there's still going to be holes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we would love to. No, no, and I think our contact information, Erica. Yeah, the, it is it's on, on that last slide. slide. That, um, our plan uh, to maybe be sent out after this to the group. So, if there's additional questions, too, feel free to reach out to Erica and I, and we'll try our best to to respond. Yeah, and again, uh, this this um, webinar was recorded. You'll automatically receive um, a uh, a copy of that plus the slides and. Um, um, we and Dave, I'm going to send you that one PDF to send to. Okay, yeah, and we'll send that out to everybody. There's nothing like um, uh, interim rules to read uh, when you need to go to school, right? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm glad we, we were here and got to, got to meet you guys. You guys were great. Uh, my head's really spinning, and uh, I know I've got to do it. And Tony, thanks to you all, as always. You do a great job, Janet and Kevin. With that, we'll close it all out and have a good week, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.